This is lecture four. Today we'll be talking about moles and mass. So last time we started talking about AMU or atomic mass units. And as we talked about a little bit previously, it's not very convenient to measure the mass of atoms or molecules in terms of grains because um, these things just don't take a lot of grains, right? They're not very massive by themselves. And so we came up with a new convention, a new unit of weight called the AMU or atomic mass unit. And originally, one AMU was equal to the mass of a single protein. But after neutrons and isotopes were discovered, uh, scientists agreed on a new definition of what one AMU meant. And they decided that one AMU was equal to one twelfth the mass of one carbon-12 atom. And so this, with this new definition, one AMU is equal to about 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24th grams, or 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms. And it's also equal to one Dalton. Now, a Dalton is essentially the exact same thing as an AMU. It's just named after a scientist named Dalton who spent a lot of time studying mass. Um, in my field, I actually study molecules and we use the term Dalton very regularly. In some uh, fields, they use the term AMU. In some, they often actually use the unified atomic mass unit described as a U. But an AMU, a Dalton, and a U are actually all exactly the same thing. They're all just equal to 1 12th the mass of a carbon 12 atom. Now, why did we settle on carbon 12? Well, I wasn't involved. This happened, uh, I don't know, 80 years before I was born, actually probably closer to 50 years before I was born. Uh, but the idea was carbon is really important to life. It's, it's uh, present in everything that we've found that's alive so far, and it's a really critical component, as are oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen, uh, and a lot of other molecules, but carbon is especially abundant. So water is generally always way more abundant. Um, carbon-12 was also selected because it's the most abundant carbon isotope. So it makes up about 98 or 99% of carbon. And it's composed, and this is the one that I think really got everyone on board, because it's composed of six protons and six neutrons. And there's just a certain amount of elegance and symmetry there. Um, so when we take one AMU or calculate one AMU, it should be about the average mass of a neutron and a proton. Um, but as we've talked about before, a neutron and a proton each weigh slightly more than one AMU. So if you take six protons, six neutrons, add up their mass, it doesn't add up to 12. It adds up to slightly more than that. And so this brings up a question of why is the nuclear mass less than the sum of all the things that are put in there, right? If you take eight or 12 billiard balls and you put them into a bag, the mass of that bag is gonna weigh the mass of 12 billiard balls plus the mass of the bag by itself. So why is this? Well, we're not gonna dive super deep into this question because then we'd be getting more into physics and more chemists. Um, but this was all answered by Albert Einstein, little Allie. So Albert Einstein said that energy is equal to mass times the speed of light squared. Now you might think, well, where'd he come up with that? And the answer is he did some crazy derivations um, and was able to come up with this. We're not gonna go through those derivations because again, that would be physics. But what Einstein, Einstein said was that as two nucleons, remember that's anything in the nucleus, as two nucleons, a proton and a neutron come together, some of the mass of each species gets converted to energy. The energy, of course, has no mass. And so when the matter gets converted into energy, the matter loses mass and loses weight. And so the more the nucleons you have in there, the more of this mass is going to get converted into energy. So the heavier something is, 
the more of its weight has already been lost to this mass defect. So as you add more protons and neutrons, you get more and more of a mass defect. Right, now that's pretty much as far into that as we're going to get. If you wanna go farther, you're gonna to have to take um, an atomic physics class um, which unfortunately I don't think we offer here at BYU. I've looked because I've wanted to take one in the past. Um, but it's a pretty interesting topic. And there's actually other things going on there too that we really don't care about as chemists. So for example, there is some arrangement issue inside the nucleus. So where specific particles are located next to each other also affects the amount of mass defect, et cetera. Um, but again, we're not going to keep getting into this topic that we keep getting into. All right, we'll move on now to calculating atomic mass. And by this, I don't mean calculating the mass of individual isotopes. You're not going to be able to do that. I'm not giving you the tools to do that. The tools for doing that are actually really complicated. What I'm talking about is calculating the average mass of the abundant isotopes. So if I say, how heavy is carbon? Well, the answer is generally 12.011 AMU or 12.011 grams per mole. And we're, we'll get into the mole in a little bit. But how do you calculate that uh, average number from isotopes? Well, let me show you how. So carbon has three naturally occurring isotopes. It has carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. Carbon-12 makes up 98.89% of the carbon we see here on Earth, and 1.1% of the carbon is carbon-13. So most of it, almost all of it, is carbon-12. And then there's a really small negligible amount of carbon-14. So how would we calculate the atomic mass of carbon? Well, you take the mass of each isotope and you multiply it by the abundance of that isotope. So carbon-12 weighs 12 AMU, carbon-13 weighs 13.003 AMU. And you might ask, how did I come up with that number? Or in other words, I as a student, how am I gonna figure that out from test time? Well, the answer, hopefully to your relief is you won't. It's impossible for you to figure that out. Um, at least at this point, maybe you'll go on to be a nuclear chemist and go work in the Bay Area and confidential work with nobody can ever know about, even though we're really just measuring how you know, heavy water is most of the time. Sorry, that was another tangent. All right, but you're gonna have to be given this value in the question or in a table. Okay, you're not gonna have to come up with it yourself. But we take the masses multiplying by the natural abundances. So this natural abundance is what we call the percent of that isotope that's present. And of course, we're not doing this in percent. We're taking 98.89% divided by 100% to give us this decimal value. If you don't do that, the math doesn't work out. But then we're just going to take 12 AMU times 0.9889 and 13 AMU times 0.011. And that gives us these numbers. You'll notice the units here are still in AMU, um, but we have to add those together to get 12.011 AMU. And that's how we calculate the average mass of the elements. That's where you get the mass that you see on the periodic table. Now, you'll learn as you look at multiple periodic tables that the positioning of a lot of these things, like the number of protons and the atomic mass, isn't standardized very well. They tend to move around. But generally, the whole number that you see is the number of protons and the number with the decimal places is the atomic mass. And some periodic tables have additional information, uh, like what state these are at room temperature, something about what the crystal structure of these things look like. They get fairly complicated, but really what you wanna focus on right now is figuring out where is the number of protons, where is the atomic mass. Now a little note on carbon-14, you don't need to know this, but I'm going to go into it anyways because it's really cool. So carbon-14 is a radioactive uh, isotope, meaning it breaks down by itself over time. And so all of the carbon-14 that was formed when the Earth is formed is basically gone. There might be a couple atoms left on the whole planet. But CO2 
it can drift up into the higher atmosphere. And the sun is actually bombarding the whole solar system with high energy neutrons. So it's just blasting them out like a machine gun. And so as the sun is machine gunning the earth, some of these neutrons actually collide with the nucleus of a carbon atom in CO2 that's up in the atmosphere. And so if that carbon is carbon 12, the sun has just turned it into carbon 13. And that's the most likely scenario because carbon 12 is there the most. Um, but there's also the chance that we got some carbon 13. And then if that catches a neutron, it gets turned into carbon 14. Now CO2, it's all churning through the atmosphere because uh, the atmosphere is just churning all the time by itself. Um, and so that carbon-14 from that CO2 can come down, drift down to the surface, where it can get uh, used up by plant materials. The plants will take in that CO2 and turn it into organic matter. That carbon will get thrown into amino acids and different plant structures. And then we'll come along, we'll eat the, those plants. Um, and so while we're consuming plants, then we are adding carbon-14 to our cells. And when animals do that, they're adding carbon-14 to themselves. But when we die, we're no longer ingesting carbon-14. We're left with the amount we have when we die, and that starts to break down. And so in most living creatures, the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-13 and carbon-12 is pretty constant. We have a constant intake, and we're constantly disposing of carbon-14 through waste. So we have a constant amount. But then once we start to die, we're not taking it in anymore. And we have some amount and it just starts to decay because carbon-14 decays into carbon-13 over time. And so scientists can then look at the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-13. They can see how long that carbon-14 has been decaying away. And that can be used to determine how old uh, material with carbon in it gets. So paints that were made from plants, et cetera. And that kind of radioactive dating can give us years back to about 50,000 years. And it's actually a lot more complicated than that, uh, but that's as far as we'll get into. And I'll stop right there, move on. But pretty interesting stuff. All right, so let's go to a practice quiz now, see how well you did with that material. If I reach into a naturally occurring sample of carbon, what are the chances of extracting a carbon atom that weighs 12.011 mu? Go ahead and pause the video now and see if you can do this. All right, the answer is 0%. There is 0% chance of ever grabbing an atom of carbon that weighs 12.011 mu. That thing doesn't exist. There is not a single atom that exists that weighs 12.011 mu. Right, you got to remember that this is the average mass of carbon. There is the carbon 12 atom that weighs exactly 12 AMU, and that has a 98.89% natural abundance, but there's nothing that weighs 12.01. That's just the average, and it's a very useful average that we're going to use constantly. All right, now let's try another question. And this one isn't a trick. That last one was a little bit of a trick, but I hope, but I think it was a trick with a good purpose to try and help you tease out the difference between the average and the individual masses. But in this question, we have neon. So neon has three naturally occurring isotopes, neon 20, neon 21, and neon 22. The masses of these are given in this table right here, as are the natural abundances of the isotopes. Go ahead from this data, figure out what the average mass of neon is. Let me pause the video here. Okay, so the way we'd work this problem is we take the individual masses of the isotopes multiplied by the natural abundances of each isotope uh, and then just add that all up. And so the answer you should have gotten, and I'll admit I haven't checked my numbers on this one this year either, but the an answer that you should have gotten was 20.1797 and if you didn't get that answer, double check your math, figure out what went wrong, and write that write down that you missed this question so that come exam time, you can review it. 
All right, so let's talk a little bit about isotopes and some of their uses because they are extremely useful. So for example, uh, in treating thyroid cancer, uh, which is a cancer within your neck, and that's often treated by treating patients with I-131 or iodine-131. I-131 is a radioactive material and thyroid cancer absorbs iodine naturally. And so then it picks up all this radioactive material and then the radioactive material, since it's decaying, then cooks your cancer away. Now, unfortunately, it can also cause other cancers, but generally it's a, it's a higher chance that it'll help. Additionally, if you inject someone with technetium-39, that can help with imaging their bones throughout their whole skeleton. So bones naturally absorb technetium. And so when technetium-99 is introduced, it can give off gamma radiation that, can, uh, that you can use and you can see where the gamma radiation is to see what your bones look like. And of course, if you watch uh, the Avengers, then gamma radiation can be detected from all over the world. It can't, all that science is wrong, but the movie is still really cool. All right, uh, so what though, if I asked you how many neutrons are in technetium, how would you approach that problem? Well, you would do it like this. You would pull out your periodic table and you would say, I don't know where technetium is, so I'm just gonna scan across the periodic table until I find it. Okay, there it is, TC43. Okay, so now I know that technetium has 43 protons. So technetium 99, we take 99 minus 43, uh, we get what? Uh, 56, so there's 56 neutrons in technetium. Now I'll give you, Another little piece of data on your periodic table, elements like this that are written in white, or that's usually used to symbolize that this is radioactive, that there's no stable form of that. So technetium, there's no stable form of technetium. Uh, there's no stable form of plutonium or americium or berkelium. So there's plenty of them that uh, just don't have a stable form. Yeah, let's turn back to the PowerPoint. So if I'm going to ask you neutrons, you're going to have to turn your periodic table, find technetium, and then do a little bit. Now, isotope natural abundances vary a lot depending on where you, where you look. And it depends a lot on which star these isotopes were formed in, how old the star is, whether it's a first generation star, a second generation star, uh, et cetera. Um, so we generally talk about natural abundances on Earth. So let me actually scoot back a little bit here. You'll notice I gave you some natural abundances with neon. As you go through and look for these natural abundances, um, you'll notice that some of the natural abundances and even some of the masses on the periodic table don't always match with other periodic tables or with Google. And the reason for that is what I was just getting into is that uh, natural abundances of these isotopes depends on where you measure. And so there's some variability there uh, based on different measurements. Uh, different samples uh, do have slightly different abundances. Um, and so if you're concerned that the number you see on your periodic table isn't the same that Google gives you, that's a known issue. And unfortunately, there's not a great solution to that yet. Um, but for exams, and so forth, just use the periodic table that I gave you in class or the, the one on the board or this one that you'll be given for the exams. Now, while those natural abundances might change, we actually know the masses of the individual isotopes really well, and those don't change. Those are just based on how many protons and neutrons are present. And the mass defect doesn't change depending on where it was formed or anything like that. Okay. So we measure the isotope masses using what's called mass spectrometry. And like I said earlier, mass spectrometry is what I do in my lab. Uh, and so 
one simple way of doing mass spectrometry is getting your atoms charged. So give them either a positive or negative charge by either adding or subtracting electrons from the atom. And there's lots of ways to do that uh, that we're not going to get into. But one of the basic principles of matter, though, is once something is charged, if it goes through a magnetic field, it curves its trajectory. Do you remember with the cathode ray tubes, that's how J.J. Thompson figured out the mass to charge ratio of an electron, is that when it traveled through a magnetic field, he saw it curve, he knew how much it curved, et cetera. And so with, uh, with matter, and once it's charged, we can send it through a magnetic field and things that weigh less, the magnetic field is gonna be able to curve more because they have less momentum. Things that weigh more get curved less, so they turn less. Um, and so we can then measure the mass of these different particles as they travel through our mass spectrometer and hit this magnetic field as they bend. We can measure their mass, or at least we can measure their mass to charge ratio uh, based on where they hit uh, detection. Okay, now AMUs are great, and I deal with them almost exclusively in my lab, or either AMUs or Daltons, whatever you want to call them. Um, but they're not super convenient in most lab settings. So for example, when you're doing Chem 107, so exa for example, when you're measuring things out, you're going to be measuring in grams, and your scales, your balances can only go to so many decimal places. Whereas one AMU is equal to 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24th grams. So you're not going to be able to measure anything in AMU. If you use the mass spectrometer, which costs, costs a whole lot, then you can measure an AMU. But we often still work in grams. All the time we still work in grams. So we need to figure out how to convert between AMU and grams. And so while we can't measure a single carbon-12 atom, we could, for example, measure 12 grams of carbon-12 atoms. And this value of 12 grams versus uh, how many atoms are of carbon-12 are there actually is a really important conversion factor. Um, and so we can figure out how many carbon-12 atoms are in 12 grams. Well, one carbon-12 atom weighs 12 AMU, and we know an AMU is equal to about 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24 grams. So we can convert the mass of one carbon-12 atom into grams by multiplying the mass of the carbon-12 atom, which is 12 AMU, by the number of grams per AMU, that conversion factor we just found. And we'll find that there's about 1.99 times 10 to the negative 23rd grams per carbon-12 atom. And then we can say, well, then how, ma how many atoms are in 12 grams of carbon-12 by dividing 12 grams by this mass of a single carbon-12 atom, which is 1.99 times 10 to the negative 23rd grams, right? So we just set up our conversion factor here. Notice we're using dimensional analysis. So these grams for, of carbon-12 will cancel with these grams, or these grams, and we'll be left with the number of atoms in 12 grams of carbon-12, which is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And this number right here, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, is a very common number known as Avogadro's number. You'll notice it's even the title of this slide. Now, Avogadro didn't actually figure this out himself. In 1811, Andre Avogadro postulated, or he thought that equal numbers of atoms or molecules were present in equal volumes of gas, regardless of which gas you're talking about. So if you have one liter of oxygen gas, it have the same number of oxygen molecules as in one liter of nitrogen gas. And then nearly a century later, John, John Baptiste Perrin came up with this number 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, and named it after Avogadro. And then subsequent scientists got us a few more decimal points. For this class, we'll just call Avogadro's number 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, even though it's known to a few more decimal places. And this number is, this Avogadro's number is really useful in converting 
between numbers of particles and mass at the Gram scale. And this no, Avogadro's number is actually given another name. We actually call it the mole. So one mole, looking at that, you might think that's a number with a unit after it. It's not. That is a number, just the same way as one dozen is a number. It's 12. Avogadro's number, or one mole, is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Right? There's no unit after this 6.022 times 20, 10 to the 23rd either. All right? So 6.022 times 20, 10 to the 23rd is Avogadro's number. And one mole of something is equal to Avogadro's number of that thing. All right? So one mole can describe anything. You can have a mole of atoms, a mole of molecules, a mole of electrons. You can have a mole of elephants. You can have a mole of anything you want, just like you can have a dozen of anything. You can have a dozen eggs, meaning you have 12 dozen eggs. You can have a dozen kids, meaning you either grew up in Utah or Idaho. Uh, that's a little bit of a joke. Plenty of people outside of those states had 12 kids, uh, though few have survived it. Another joke. All right. But one mole of anything is always Avogadro's number of that thing. In other words, it's always 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of that thing. A mole of moles would be 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd moles. And if you had that many moles, it'd be a giant meatball. This is a really gross image, but a giant meatball roughly the size of the moon. It'd actually be a little bigger than that. If you had one mole of dollar bills, that would mean you had 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd dollar bills. And a fun little brain exercise is if you had that many, if you had a mole of dollar bills, and every day you gave $1,000 away to every person on earth, there's about 7.5 billion people on earth, how long would your money last? Well, it would actually last 220 million years. Take a long time to give away a mole of dollar bills. And there's not that much money on the earth. If you add up all the currency of every nation that has ever existed on the earth, pretty sure you still don't come up with one mole of currency. And another one, how much water do you think it takes to make a mole of water? Is it a pool? Is it a pond, a lake? Is it a whole ocean? Well, let me actually stop sharing the screen with you for a second and I'll show you one mole of water. Oh, my virtual background is making it hard to see, but this is about one mole of water. It's not very much. It's about 18 milliliters of water or 18 grams of water. Right here in my hand in this, uh, in this graduated cylinder, I'm holding 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of water. Which is pretty incredible when you think about it, about how many things are here. Anyways, let's get back to the PowerPoint here. So the takeaway here, though, is that a mole of anything is always 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. But how much volume is taken up by that mole and the mass of that mole depends on what you're talking about. Okay, so mass and volume do not, are not constantly related to the number of things, right? And another way of thinking about this is if you have a dozen eggs, that's going to weigh more than if you have a dozen marbles or a dozen students. You have a mole of copper, for example, which is shown here in this beaker, and that's going to weigh more than a mole of sulfur, even though the sulfur is taking up more volume than the copper. So volume, and mass depend on what you're specifically talking about. And here in these beakers, this is an actual picture with one mole of copper, one mole of silicone, one mole of tin, one mole of magnesium, and a mole of sulfur. Okay, well, let's see how you're doing with that concept with an eye clicker quiz. So of the items listed below, which weighs the, mole, the most? I have one mole of sulfur atoms, one mole of lead atoms, one mole of aluminum, one mole of helium, and one mole of iron. Go ahead and pause the video, see if you can figure this out. 
So the way you're going to figure this out is you're just going to look on the periodic table, to figure out what the mass of these things are. I'm not going to jump over to the periodic table in this video. I'll just show you what the periodic table says is the mass of each of these. Um, so sulfur, it comes in at 32, lead's at 207 grams per mole, aluminum's 26.982, helium comes in at 4, and iron comes in at 58 or 55.847. So you'll notice that lead is the heaviest of each of those five blocks. Okay. So your molar mass then is your mass in grams of one mole or Avogadro's number of a substance. Now, how do we go from the mass on the periodic table in AMU to the molar mass or the mass of one mole of this? Well, let's practice. We'll practice with helium. So on the periodic table, it says that one atom of helium weighs 4.003 AMU. Okay, so 4.003 AMU per one atom of helium. We're gonna times that uh, by the conversion factor from going from an AMU to grams, which is 1.66 times 10 to the negative 24th grams per AMU. And then we're gonna multiply that by Avogadro's number uh, of helium atoms per one mole of helium. You'll notice there that the AMU cancel out, the helium atoms cancel out, and you're just left with grams per moles of helium. And you'll notice that the answer here is 4.003 grams per mole. And if you'll notice, we started with 4.003 AMU. Now this is not a coincidence. This was entirely on purpose. So that number on the periodic table, you'll notice usually is left without units. And that's because it refers to the mass of one atom in AMU. It also refers to the mass of one mole in grains. Now this is true for every single element on the periodic table. So the average mass of one atom of zinc is 65.3 AMU. One mole of zinc weighs 65.38 grains. So this is a number actually given, I, I guess you could say in two units, both an AMU per mole, or sorry, AMU per atom and grams per mole. Right? One atom of mercury is 200.59 AMU and one mole of mercury is, weighs 100.5 grams. I might have messed up what I said there, but I think you got it. Okay, so, but what do we do now about compounds? like sodium chloride and water. How do we calculate their molar masses? Well, the way we're going to do that is just by summing up the masses of the individual atoms present. So for example, in water, we have H2O, there's two hydrogens present, one oxygen present. So we're going to look and find the mass of hydrogen on the periodic table, which is 1.00794 grams. We're going to multiply that times two because there are two hydrogen atoms present. And then we're going to add that to the mass of oxygen times the number of oxygens, which is one. That's why we've just got 15.994 written here by itself. So we'll do this math on our calculator and it'll come up with 18.0153 grams. So this is how many grams there are per mole of water molecules. So in Avogadro's number of water molecules, that weighs 18 grams. So if we're calculating the mass of ammonia here, we'd look up the mass of nitrogen, which is 14.007, multiply it by the number of nitrogens, which is one, and then add that to the mass of our hydrogen times three, because there's three hydrogens, and get a mass of 17.031 grams. We're going to calculate the mass of sodium chloride, which is table salt. Uh, then we would look up the mass of sodium, which is 22.99, the mass of chlorine, which is 35.453. And this would give us a mass of 58.443 grams. Now there is actually a difference here. This table salt is made up of ions. It's not actually a molecule. It's actually a crystal. We'll get more into that distinction and how you can tell later on. Um, but this mass right here for sodium chloride, we actually call formula mass 
Uh, so this is the mass, we'd say the molar mass of sodium chloride, um, but it's not a molecular mass, it's a formula mass. So molecular mass works for molecules and formula mass for ionic compounds. And again, you don't need to know the difference there just yet, or you don't need to be able to tell the difference just yet. We'll get into that later into the, into the semester. But what you really need to understand at this point is that the mole is a number that we use primarily as a conversion factor. So if we're going from the number of particles, we're going to multiply that by the ratio of moles to particles per mole, right? And that will get us into the number of moles of something. So let's say we had 10 billion atoms, and we have to figure out how many moles of that. Well, then we would multiply by one mole per Avogadro's number of particles. The answer is it's a really small uh, number of moles. And vice versa, if we're trying to go from number of moles to number of particles, then we would take the number of moles times Avogadro's number of particles per one mole, and then the moles would cancel out and we get the number of particles. Now we can take this one step further also and say, well, what if I don't have exactly a mole of something? What if I have half a mole? of something, or if I don't have, let's say we're dealing with water, if I don't have 18 grams of water, I have 10 grams of water, how am I supposed to figure out then uh, how many particles I have? Well, you'll do it like this. You'll take the measured amount and then divide by what's called the molar mass. So for water, the molar mass is 18 grams. It's what we calculated. So we'll take the measured amount divide by the molar mass or times it by one mole per, per some mass of that thing, and then times Avogadro's uh, number of particles per one mole, and that's how we get the number of particles. So if this diagram isn't helping you, let's go to an example. So I could ask you how many moles of sodium ions, sodium ions is Na plus, are in a 227 gram box of baking soda just like you'd buy at the store and put in your fridge and forget about for a while. Well, baking soda has a molecular formula, or actually uh, it's not a molecular formula because this is an ionic species. So the sodium bonds with, with the HCl3 minus ion, uh, and we'll get more into the bicarbonate ion later. But baking soda has a formula mass of 84 grams per mole. And so if we're trying to figure out how many uh, or how many moles of sodium ions do I have in 227 grams, the way we do or figure this out is we take 227 grams of baking soda, multiply that by one mole of baking soda for every 84 grams of baking soda. And if I didn't give you this 84 grams, which I don't have to give you that uh, formula mass, uh, you'd have to look at this and calculate from the periodic table what the formula mass of that species is. Um, so once you have that, then you take that measured mass divided by the molecular weight or the formula weight. And then we need to figure out not just how many moles of baking soda we have, but how many moles of sodium we have. And we'll notice that there is one sodium atom for every unit of baking soda there. Or another way of saying that is we have one mole of sodium for every one mole of baking soda. And that works out conveniently here. And then we would multiply all this through, cancel out units, and we'd be able to find that there's 2.7 moles of sodium in one box of baking soda. Now here, there just happened to be one mole of sodium for, for every mole of baking soda. That's not always the case. So for example, right here with oxygen, you'd have three moles of oxygen for every mole of baking soda. And sodium phosphate, you have three moles of sodium for every mole of sodium phosphate, et cetera. So you do have to look at the actual number of the species of interest in the formula to work with. Then I could make the problem a little harder. I could ask you a harder problem like this. Is there more sodium in one tablespoon or 24 grams of baking soda or in one teaspoon or eight grams of table salt? 
Now, again, here, I don't necessarily have to give you the formula mass of table salt or of baking soda. You are going to need to be able to look at the periodic table and calculate that yourself. And most of the time when I give you a question like this on an exam or a question in your homework, I'm not going to give you the formula weight. You're going to have to figure that out for yourself. And so it might be a good idea to practice that uh, right now. Find some molecules you like. Uh, you could take ammonium chloride. You can just look up the formula for that on Google. Try and calculate out the molecular mass of it and then compare that to what Google says the molecular mass is. Okay, but let's focus on our problem. Is there more sodium in this tablespoon of uh, baking soda or more sodium in one teaspoon of table salt? All right, so we take the measured mass of each of these things, so 24 grams of baking soda, and divide that by the molecular weight of baking soda, which I gave to you in the previous problem, times the number of moles of sodium in moles of baking soda. There's one mole of sodium for every mole of baking soda. And so in one tablespoon of baking soda, there's 0 0.29 moles of sodium. In eight grams of sodium chloride, we divide that by the molecular weight of sodium chloride, which is 58.443 grams. We multiply that by the number of moles of sodium in every mole of sodium chloride, which again, fortunately is one to one. Uh, and we find that there's 0 0.14 moles of sodium in one teaspoon of table salt. So there is more sodium in one tablespoon of baking soda. But if you'll notice here, we use three times as much baking soda as we did salt, uh, but we only had about twice as much sodium as we did in the salt, right? So formulas there really matter. And I could have come up with a formula here uh, where it would have been more sodium and the less massive thing. I hope you can see that by looking at this. Right? So I also want you to be able to look at chemical formulas like NaHCO3 or sodium chlorides formula, NaCl, and realize that that's both a ratio of atoms and moles of atoms. So that would say that you have one mole of sodium for every mole of chlorine, or you have one uh, sodium atom for every chlorine atom. Another way of saying that is you have one dozen sodium atoms for every dozen chlorine atoms, atoms right? So this is a ratio, uh, but it also tells you how many atoms are in a specific molecule. All right, we'll finish off now with practice problem. Now on this one, I'm not going to give you the molecular weight. You're going to have to figure that out for yourself. But I want you to figure out how many moles of chalk, which is primarily calcium carbonate or CaCO3, are present in one stick or 58.4 grams of chalk. Go ahead and pause the video and see if you can figure that out. Okay, so the way we'll have to figure this out First, we're going to have to look up the masses of all our elements from the periodic table. So we have the mass of calcium, which is about 40 grams per mole, the mass of carbon, the mass of oxygen. We're then going to need to, to add those up and multiply by the number of each element that are present to figure out our mass of calcium carbonate. So there's one calcium atom present. There are one carbon atoms present and three oxygen atoms present multiplied by their respective weights. We add all that up and we get 100.086 grams per mole. I did leave off the units off of all of these numbers just for the sake of space, but generally you don't want to do that. And we're able to find the mass was, or the molar mass was 100.086 grams per mole. And we're trying to figure out how many moles 58.4 grams is. So all we're going to have to do is take 58.4 grams, divide by 100 grams per mole. Since this is really close to 100, uh, that math works out really easy for us. And we're able to find that there are 0 0.584 moles present in the chalk. Hopefully all that made sense to you. Uh, if it didn't, let me know or reach out to a TA or your recitation team. Good luck.